Okay, well, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name's Adam Maxwell, and I'm a member of the IEEE UFC Society's Education Committee. Um, it's our pleasure to introduce the sixth webinar in the virtual lecture education series. And these are lectures that, um, that, that we present as an opportunity to our members worldwide to learn from and interact with our distinguished lecturers, star ambassadors, and other members of the UFFC uh, Society. And um, you can find and register for future lectures on the upcoming events listed on the UFFC Society's uh, website. So just a few details about today's seminar. You can type questions into the chat function anytime during or after the lecture, and these are to be addressed in the following question and answer period. The entire session will be recorded and placed on uh, the Society's YouTube channel for review and also for those who are not able to join us today. And so please also keep an eye out uh, for an email after the lecture with a very brief survey, share any suggestions or feedback that you have. Um, finally, I just like to say a huge thank you to the members of the education committees and lecture series committees, as well as our student representatives for their efforts in launching this program. Um, in particular, thanks to Stephen Lee, Molly Bracken, and Ro Chen Liu uh, for their help with organizing the lectures as well as the video editing and captioning. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Alfred Yu from University of Waterloo. Alfred. Thank you, Adam. Um, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening um, to those of you in Asia. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Himanshu Shekhar, who is currently an assistant professor in electrical engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology at Gandhinagar. He is actually our star ambassador of the UFFC Society. In terms of research, Dr. Shekhar and his lab mates They've been doing tons of fun work in the field of biomedical uh, sound. Like they make bubbles, they pop bubbles, they look at bubbles, uh, and they use bubbles for imaging and therapy, you name it. Uh, uh, and well, like it's well summarized in the name of his lab, the Muse Lab. So today, Dr. Shakar, he's going to tell us more about his lab's recent efforts in advancing cavitation mediated therapy, image guidance, and monitoring. Lots of interesting emerging research to be. Uh, presented over the next 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, so now I will pass this on to Himeshu. Himeshu, thank you for joining us. Um, the floor is now yours. It's a pre-recorded uh, video. Um, let's start playing. Thank you so much for the introduction and for joining the talk today. I'll be talking about our work, which we are doing over at the Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. Uh, I'll be speaking about cavitation mediated therapy, image guidance and monitoring. The MUSE lab or the medical ultrasound engineering lab uh, focuses on a three pronged approach. Uh, we look at the technology involved in medical ultrasound, the mechanisms of imaging and therapy, and we are interested in translating these techniques for the healthcare applications to take technologies from the bench to the bedside. We have two PIs who are working together at the Muse lab, uh, myself and Professor Carla Mercado Shekhar. And here is, uh, are the uh, facilities and the setup. We work on a spectrum of applications ranging from therapeutic ultrasound to diagnostic ultrasound. So talking about therapeutic ultrasound, several interesting applications have emerged in the past couple of decades. Some of the new exciting ones being neuromodulation, image guided thermal ablation, blood brain barrier opening, drug delivery, etc. And some of the advantages of therapeutic ultrasound uh, are that it is non-invasive and uses non-ionizing energy. There is a possibility of high spatial specificity of treatment because of focusing uh, of medical ultrasound. We can modify the exposure parameters for inducing appropriate bioeffects. At lower exposure uh, intensities, we get separate bioeffects from what we get at higher exposure intensities. And this technology can be combined with other agents such as uh, drug delivery vehicles, 
drugs, therapeutics, etc., uh, to explore the synergy. And this technology is easily guide, easily combined with image guidance uh, for improving both the safety and efficacy of therapy. So uh, coming to therapeutic ultrasound, there are thermal and mechanical mechanisms predominantly. And when it comes to thermal mechanisms, some examples are uh, mild heating of the body tissues uh, for physiotherapy, which falls under hyperthermia, as well as high intensity focused ultrasound or high food surgery. Here's a schematic which shows exposure of uh, healthy cells uh, with focused ultrasound. And this leads to the denature, denaturation of the cell membrane and the uh, death due to thermal necrosis. Similarly, there's also a mechanical mechanism to therapeutic ultrasound and cavitation and radiation force are the more prominent ones here. Uh, and here is an example of cavitation, whereas a bubble is oscillating. This image was acquired by uh, Dr. Jason Raymond. Uh, here, as the ultrasound exposes the bubble, you can see the bubble oscillating and uh, it can reach, uh, it can cause a range of bio effects uh, depending on whether the bubble is oscillating in a stable cavitation mode or inertial cavitation mode. And some of the effects that are associated with this type of uh, uh, oscillation are drug delivery by the enhancement of sonoporation. Here's an example from Zong et al, where there's a cell after being exposed to ultrasound develops micro pores and within a time scale of about tens of seconds, these pores are healed. So you can improve a drug transport. You can also achieve thrombolytic efficacy by uh, the cavitation. And another application is opening of the blood brain barrier safely and reversibly. And then lastly, at very high amplitudes, you can get uh, mechanical ablation, which I'll talk about briefly today called histotripsy. Now, I briefly mentioned cavitation. Cavitation is uh, bubble activity in response to ultrasound. It could involve bubble nucleation or in some case, if nuclei are already present, either uh, in situ or because of administration of cavitation nuclei. Uh, then the bubble activity can be broadly classified into two regimes, stable or non-inertial cavitation and inertial cavitation. And here is a schematic from Collis where uh, a bubble is oscillating in stable cavitation mode and it produces these micro streaming flow patterns around it. And here's the famous image of a bubble collapsing against a hard surface. And uh, this is an inertial cavitation mode and you can see a jet being formed, which is impinging on the surface, uh, leading to surface damage. But depending on how hard the surface is, the jet can face the surface or away from the surface. Now, both these cavitation regimes lead to different types of bio effects. So it is important to be able to monitor and classify these effects. And this is where looking at uh, bubble activity or listening to bubble activity passively helps. Uh, if we look at the spectral signature of bubble activity, for example, let's say we expose the bubble to two megahertz ultrasound. Then if we look at uh, uh, inertial cavitation, it has this broadband signature, which we see here in, in the green plot. Uh, there's broadband energy uh, in the inharmonic bands. And if we look at stable cavitation uh, in red, then you get almost like a line spectrum with the presence of sub and ultra and harmonic uh, frequencies. So uh, therapeutic monitoring can be thus performed by cavitation detection and imaging. So today I'll be talking about uh, some of the work that we have initiated in the past three years at the Muse lab, uh, particularly cavitation detection using fiber bright grating sensors. These are a class of optical sensors. We'll be talking about characterizing cavitation nuclei, uh, protein shell bubbles. Uh, then I'll speak about image guidance for cavitation mediated therapy, which is histotripsy in this case. And lastly, I'll talk about the preliminary evaluation of a sono sensitizer for anti-cancer therapy in vitro. So first, uh, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Arup, uh, he is a faculty member in electrical engineering at IIT Gandhinagar. Dr. Chandan Jha, who is a postdoctoral fellow in my group, and uh, Kuldeep Jajoria, who is a project assistant and an incoming PhD student in my group. And this work has been published recently in the May issue of uh, IEEE Transactions on Ultrasonic Spheroelectrics and Frequency Control. 
It's titled a fiber bag rating based sensor for passive cavitation detection at megahertz frequencies. So these fiber bag ratings are actually optical sensors with very high sensitivity. Uh, their features are that they are immune to electromagnetic interference. They are fairly robust and inexpensive. They can be easily multiplexed. And therefore, we hypothesize that these could be useful potentially for therapeutic ultrasound applications. And the particular application we are looking at in this work is cavitation detection. So here I would like to describe the working principle of the fiber bag grating. You could have a grating which would typically have a, a length of 1 to 15 millimeters and a diameter of about 250 micrometer. And these gratings are actually wavelength selective mirrors. And the wavelength at which you get the reflection back is called the Bragg wavelength. So for example, uh, here is a grating schematic. And uh, when you give broadband light to the grating, it actually reflect, reflects back light only at the Bragg wavelength lambda b. And uh, you can see that all other wavelengths are filtered. Now, if we put strain on this grating, then the spacing between these grating elements changes and this Bragg wavelength shifts. So that can be used to uh, characterize the strain that the grating is experiencing. These gratings have very high strain sensitivity. And as I mentioned before, multiplexing capability. And because they are largely optical sensors, so they are immune to electromagnetic interference, which could be useful for applications such as MR guided HIFU. So we first wanted to see if ultrasound can be detected using FBG sensors. Some work exists in uh, uh, ultrasound detection uh, for non-destructive testing using fiber bragg rating sensors at low kilohertz frequencies, but very minimal work has been done at frequencies which are relevant for medical ultrasound. So we first uh, took a grating. So this grating was mounted on this plastic ring. As you can see, this thin wire-like grating is on the plastic ring. And we expose it to ultrasound. Uh, we uh, used a 20 cycle burst. Uh, we ultrasound signal by positioning the grating at the focus of the transducer and the receive signal was interrogated for shift in drag wavelength. So here is a schematic where uh, the spectrum at two different acoustic pressure values uh, is shown. And using the shift in drag wavelength, we were able to record the signal using both a fiber drag grating. And we had comparison uh, with experiments performed using a needle hydrophone. So here, what you can see are uh, waveforms captured using uh, the needle hydrophone, which is in blue, and the FBG sensor in red. Uh, this is the the waveform for one megahertz transducer and then here is a waveform captured for the 10 megahertz transducer and the waveforms are fairly similar they have a similar form and the spectrum was calculated here uh, and uh, is compared so if you see uh, the difference between the fundamental and the harmonic signals uh, they are comparable for uh, both the fiber drag grating sensor and the hydrophone here we can see uh, detection of up to the third harmonic and here uh, uh, the second harmonic is clearly visible in the signal that was acquired with the FBG uh, and the needle hydrophone. So we also did a comparison of the bandwidth of these sensors. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is a 0.2 millimeter or 200 micrometer needle hydrophone from precision acoustics that we use for this study. Uh, and we used as a source a 20 megahertz center frequency broadband PVDF transducer, which was excited using a broadband impulse and the received signal was captured either using the hydrophone or using the FBG sensor. So the plot on top in black is the, uh, is the uh, spectrum that was obtained from the FBG sensor and the one in the bottom is the spectrum obtained using the hydrophone. And we measured the 20 dB bandwidth. Uh, the 20 dB bandwidth of FBG was 32.5 megahertz, while that of the hydrophone was 35 megahertz. So you can see that the performance is comparable. In any case, um, for the applications that we are looking at, uh, this bandwidth should be sufficient. 
then we plotted uh, uh, the photo detector voltage against the uh, impinging ultrasound pressure for uh, 1 megahertz, 5 megahertz, and 10 megahertz transducers. And we were interested in evaluating the linearity and precision of the sensor. So we went all the way up to 1.2 megapascals and we measured the photo detector voltage. And what we observed that the plot was, uh, uh, was uh, strongly linear where, as evidenced by these R square values of 0.994 and 0.996 for the peak negative and peak positive pressures respectively. The coefficient of variation was only about 3.4 and 3.2 percent. And uh, same analysis was done for 1 megahertz, 5 megahertz and 10 megahertz transducer. And we saw a uh, good linear response, uh, low coefficient of variation and high sensitivity. For example, the sensitivity was 0.77 volt per megapascal at 5 megahertz. Then we wanted to explore whether these sensors can be used for passive cavitation detection applications which require high sensitivity. So we used uh, a focused ultrasound transducer which has a 2 megahertz center frequency and we excited it using a 80 cycle sine burst. This was a pre-calibrated transducer and then we put some uh, micro bubbles in the path uh, of this transducer uh, in a water tank and these micro bubbles were in an acoustically transparent sample chamber. The scattered signal was detected uh, using either a fiber bracket grating sensor or this broadband 20 megahertz PVDF receiver. And here uh, we plot the spectra received using the FBG which is in red and uh, using the PVDF transducer which is in blue. So uh, we found that uh, if we look at the difference between the fundamental uh, signal and the subharmonic or the fundamental signal and the ultraharmonic or let's say the fundamental signal and the second order ultraharmonic at 2.5 f naught then uh, the values are quite comparable for the FBG sensor as well as the PVDF sensor. Uh, higher harmonics uh, above 10 megahertz uh, were not observed using the uh, FBG sensor that could be because of the limited bandwidth of the optical interrogator used in the study. Nonetheless, the, these results show the feasibility of using a fiber bracket grating for detecting cavitation and we are now interested in multiplexing multiple sensors as well as, uh, uh, as, well as investigating whether trans skull cavitation detection can be performed using these types of sensors. Given the small aperture size of these sensors, the fact that their performance compares with uh, these PVDF sensors with an extended aperture size is fairly encouraging and we plan to explore this further in uh, future studies. Next, I would like to change gears and talk about our work in collaboration with Samir Dalvi's group at IIT Gandhinagar in which we characterize protein shell microbubbles. Uh, these are pegylated bovine serum albumin microbubbles which are filled with decafluorobutane gas. And uh, this work was conducted by Anuj Kaushik. He's a postdoctoral fellow in our group and Akib Khan, who's a PhD student in Samir's group. So uh, uh, several previous manuscripts have been reported from Samir's group with these types of uh, micro bubbles. They showed the ability to suppress the immunogenicity caused by BSA with pegylation. Uh, they showed the ability to load drugs and uh, they showed temporal and shelf stability. However, the performance of these bubbles in nucleating cavitation has not yet been characterized, which is the focus of this work. So we first prepared uh, these bovine serum albumin micro bubbles by sonication of BSA solution with decafluorobutane uh, bubbling. And then we size isolated uh, three different populations by differential centrifugation based on uh, techniques outlined by Feshtan and colleagues. So here are the three different size distributions with mean sizes of 1.89, 3.54 and 4.24 micrometers. And we have also plotted the size distribution of Sonoview, the commercial contrast agent for comparison. So next we perform studies in which uh, the cavitation response was measured. The bubbles were placed in an acoustically transparent chamber and then using a confocal transducer setup, we exposed the scattered sound was received using a passive cavitation detector. Uh, 
This is a, a PVDF uh, transducer with a center frequency of 20 megahertz. And here are some representative cavitation plots that we observe, especially at the higher pressures here. We see the presence of sub and ultra harmonics um, indicating that stable cavitation is present. So here is the spectrum for BSA1, BSA2 and BSA3 microbubbles. So a uh, sub threshold, which is the blue curve, we do not see these sub and ultra harmonics, but the moment we exceed the threshold, there's a sudden appearance of these sub and ultra harmonics. So we uh, quantified these thresholds by using a three piece linear fit. Uh, uh, this is the technique used uh, previously at the University of Cincinnati. And then from the knee in this curve, we uh, are able to find the stable cavitation threshold as well as the saturation regions. So in this case for Sonoview, uh, we observe stable cavitation at peak negative pressures of 270 kilopascal. Uh, for BSA-1 population, which has a mean size of about 1.8 micrometer, uh, the stable cavitation threshold was about 300 kilopascal and it was 340 kilopascal and 850 kilopascal as the bubble size increased further. So these results show the ability of modifying the micro bubble size to vary the stable cavitation threshold and uh, taken together with previous work, which shows drug loading capability as well as stability. This work has now prepared us for in vivo studies and we are particularly excited about testing uh, therapy in oral cancer with these protein shell micro bubbles. Oral cancer is a major problem in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia and it is an under research topic which we are now trying to address. So uh, with that, I would like to move on to a different topic in which we have been working, which is image guidance for cavitation mediated therapy and in particular histotripsy. This work uh, has been performed in collaboration with the Bader lab, uh, Professor Kenneth Bader at the University of Chicago and Vishwas Trivedi from my group and Emily Wallach from uh, participated in this work. So as we all know, histotripsy is a mechanical ablation process. And here are some uh, results from University of Michigan in which a perforation was created in cardiac tissue using histotripsy. The bubble activity here causes uh, this uh, perforation and the spatial specificity of this therapy can be assessed from the fact that if you look at the uh, HNE images in histology, then you can see a very clear demarcation between the treated and untreated areas. In fact, at a microscopic scale, some cells are half treated and uh, the other half is intact. Therefore, the margins are very sharp for this therapy, which makes it promising and potentially, um, potentially it could perform better than uh, thermal therapy where the boundary may not be as sharp. So while this therapy is exciting, imaging of the bubble cloud which is where the therapy is actually uh, happening is essential to ensure safety and effectiveness of treatment. But from deep abdominal targets are diminished relative to the background. And even though typically the uh, histotripsy bubble cloud is hyper echogenic, it is difficult to localize and isolate the bubble cloud based on B-mode images. Therefore, our group uh, previously explored chirp coded excitation and subharmonic mash filtering to improve visualization of bubble cloud. And this work was done by Emily Wallach and uh, uh, Kenneth Bader. Uh, the Bader lab uh, is where the experiments were performed. So what we did was we uh, used chirp coded excitation in combination with subharmonic mash filtering in an, uh, in an attempt to enhance the visualization of the bubble cloud. So either phantoms or small animals were placed in the target region and a histotripsy transducer was used to expose the tissue, target tissue. The signals were imaged using an L74 imaging array and then image analysis was performed later. And uh, uh, this is the timing diagram after the histotripsy pulse trigger. Histotripsy insonation was performed for two microseconds, following which uh, the image acquisition was performed with uh, a frame rate of 1 kilohertz. And here is a representative chirp coded pulse with a bandwidth of 7 to 12 megahertz, duration of 1.9 microseconds and 18 cycles. So here are some phantom results. 
Uh, first, we have phantoms here where uh, there are no scatterers in the phantom. So with the exception of the bubble clouds, the background is hypoechogenic and the cloud is very well visible in both the fundamental and the subharmonic image. And here the subharmonic image does not necessarily improve the visualization of the cloud. But when we look at a phantom, which is uh, doped with four gram per liter cornstarch, uh, which introduces these background scatterers, or eight gram per liter of cornstarch, we see that visualizing the bubble cloud becomes challenging. However, uh, after subharmonic mesh filtering, we are able to enhance the visualization of the cloud relative to the fundamental image. However, there is still room for improvement. Therefore, we employed Volterra filtering to enhance the visualization of the bubble cloud. Volterra filtering employs uh, uh, the Volterra series. It's a well-known non-linear model. Uh, however, in contrast to Taylor series, uh, which is another non-linear series, the Volterra uh, series actually has memory. And so this is the expression of the Volterra series and it can be broken into linear quadratic component, cubic component and other higher order components. Uh, this is from Du and Abini's work in which they employed Volterra series for contrast enhanced ultrasound imaging. So uh, we can set memory, uh, M memory for the uh, Volterra series. And if we exclude these memory uh, component of the Volterra series, then it reduces to the Taylor series. So if we look at second order Volterra filtering, this is a way to uh, isolate nonlinearities across the bandwidth in which uh, we, uh, we consider M memory, ignoring the residual component, the input can be decomposed uh, into a sum of linear and nonlinear response. So here is a linear response and here is the quadratic component. And then uh, the terms in the quadratic component, uh, HQ, uh, these are the filter parameters that can be tuned based on the data that we have collected using least square optimization. And then the Volterra uh, model can be used to visualize the bubble cloud. So this approach was uh, used on the same data that had been acquired previously. Uh, but in the uh, data processing chain, we, uh, we added a post beam formed uh, after the post beam form data, we added quadratic Volterra filtering uh, before envelope detection, log compression and intensity mapping and scaling. So here are uh, some of the results which, uh, uh, which we obtained. So first looking at the four gram per liter uh, cornstarch phantom, uh, this is a conventional B mode image and while the bubble cloud is visible, uh, it is not very well delineated from the background and subharmonic mesh filtering uh, suppresses the background to some extent and improves the contrast to tissue ratio. However, when we combine subharmonic mesh filtering with this quadratic Volterra filter, we can see that there is a near complete suppression of the background and the contrast to tissue ratio is uh, enhanced. The same trend was observed in the 8 gram per liter cornstarch phantom. Here is actually the bubble cloud and it's very challenging to de delineate against the background. And with subharmonic mesh filtering, we see some enhancement relative to the background. And then there's a further enhancement with the Volterra filtering. So in both these cases, uh, we can observe that the contrast to tissue ratio uh, improves by almost twofold relative to subharmonic mesh filtering alone. And the subharmonic, uh, uh, and although there is improvement with subharmonic mesh filtering, with uh, the presence of Volterra filter, we achieved CTRs ranging from 12 dB to 25 decibels. So these results show the preliminary promise of this approach. Uh, our next step will be to focus on evaluation of ex vivo and a large animal model for this approach of image guidance of histotripsy. The last project that I would like to talk to you today about is the evaluation of a sonosensitizer for anti-cancer therapy. This is an ongoing collaborative project which is done uh, at IIT Gandhinagar in collaboration with professors Iti Gupta and Dheeraj Bhatia and Dr. Manita Das and Vishwa Patel from my group were involved in this work. Sonodynamic therapy involves the exposure of a sonosensitizing chemical to ultrasound and in the presence of acoustic cavitation through mechanisms such as sonoluminescence and pyrolysis, reactive oxygen species are generated 
which can lead to the apoptosis or necrosis of the target tissue. Other ultrasound based mechanisms may also contribute to sonodynamic therapy in addition to ROS generation. You may be familiar with photodynamic therapy in which light is used to generate these reactive oxygen species. Photodynamic therapy is already FDA approved for treating certain superficial cancers. However, if deep seated tissue is to be targeted, then sonodynamic therapy may be an attractive alternative to photodynamic therapy given its ability to be focused deep inside the body non-invasively. Porphyrin derivatives are being investigated widely uh, as photo and sono sensitizers and in Professor Iti Gupta's group, uh, a novel porphyrin molecule has been developed and reported for photodynamic therapy. This is the publication in Journal of Organic Chemistry in which this thioglycolated trans A2, B2 type porphyrin was characterized and it was shown that this type of porphyrin leads to improved cellular uptake. Uh, these uh, porphyrins end up largely in the endoplasmic reticulum and it has been shown that the uptake is higher over non-metallated porphyrins and traditional sonosensitizers such as rose bengal. However, the sonodynamic behavior of uh, this agent has not been studied previously, which is the focus of uh, the present work. So we first quantified ROS generation with sonodynamic therapy. The ROS species that we were looking at was singlet oxygen. Uh, using this molecule called DPBF, which is a scavenger of singlet oxygen and shows a spectral peak at 410 nanometers, we were able to quantify ROS generation. Uh, the sonosensitizer was added in an aqueous solution uh, in a Petri plate and exposed to 1 megahertz ultrasound. This is a therapeutic ultrasound transducer which is used in physiotherapy. Uh, it's an unfocused transducer. Uh, it may be important to point out at this point that the exposure intensities that we are uh, reporting are based on calibration in a water tank. We have not yet performed in situ calibrations and the presence of standing waves is there. Therefore, we may need to have a second look at the intensities that are being reported today. These experiments were, were performed uh, in a dark environment to avoid any stray light exposure and confounding effects due to photodynamic therapy. So here is the spectrum of the sham group in which uh, there is no drop in the peak of uh, DPBF scavenger, but in response to ultrasound at different uh, uh, intensity and exposures, you see that there is a drop in the peak of DPBF from which we can quantify the ROS. So here there is a statistically significant increase at 2 watt per centimeter square when the exposure was only for one minute. And here there's a statistically significant decrease uh, in ROS generation for 1.5 watt per centimeter square and 2 watt per centimeter square exposure when the treatment duration was three minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also saw that for five minute exposure, uh, there was a statistically significant decrease in the absorbance of uh, DPBF for one watt per centimeter square, 1.5 watt per cent centimeter square and two watt per centimeter square, indicating the generation of ROS. We also perform quantum yield calculations. There's previous literature on the quantum yield of Rose Bengal and using uh, the standard curve, we were able to compare the quantum yield of the novel porphyrin. Uh, measurements were performed at 324 nanometer. And we found that the quantum yield of this novel sonosensitizer sensitizer is about 80% that of the reported yield of Rose Bengal. Now, while the quantum yield is lower, we still anticipate this sensitizer to improve performance in vivo, given that it has increased retention and uptake in cells. So this is something that, uh, this is a hypothesis that has to be tested in future in vivo studies. But nonetheless, we went ahead with these studies in vitro. So cell culture studies were performed using some 159 breast cancer cell line with the trans A2B2 porphyrin and we chose a 15 micromolar concentration of this agent after uh, initial preliminary studies. We also observed that ultrasound alone uh, did not cause change in percentage viability over the duration of treatment. The ultrasound frequency that was used was 1 megahertz and continuous wave exposure was used. 
the cytotoxicity was determined using an MTT assay. So here is the cytotoxicity quantified uh, when ultrasound was exposed uh, to the uh, when the sonosensitizer was exposed using ultrasound. And here's the percentage cell viability. Uh, blue, uh, brown, and red colors show treatment exposure for one minute, three minutes, and five minutes respectively. These are the different intensities which were uh, used. And we saw that there is a drop in cell viability. And in particular, at 1.5 watt per centimeter square exposure, for three minutes of ultrasound, uh, there was a 30% drop in cell viability. There was a, a the cell viability dropped to 30%. That means there was a 70% drop in cell viability. These results determine the preliminary potential of uh, the novel porphyrin uh, on in vitro breast cancer cells. And next, we plan to load the sonosensitizers in nano carriers and assess their potential in an in vivo model. So uh, I would like to summarize what I have talked about today. We discussed an optical fiber Bragg grating based sensor for cavitation detection, and we are currently uh, testing these sensors for trans skull cavitation detection. We talked about histotripsy bubble cloud detection. Moving forward, we would like to test this ex vivo and in vivo in a large animal model. We discussed cavitation nucleation using BSA shelled microbubbles, and we are exploring their use in oral cancer therapy. Oral cancer is a major issue in South and Southeast Asia, and therefore we are trying to target uh, oral cancer therapy. And we also discussed sonodynamic anti-cancer therapy, uh, by, and we evaluated a sonosensitizer in vitro and showed its promise in cancer therapy. There are other research areas that are being investigated in the MUSE lab. As uh, mentioned, uh, the MUSE lab is being co-led by Professor Carla Mercado Shekhar as well. And she is working on areas such as uh, using nanoscale agents for drug delivery, ultrasound elastography, quantitative ultrasound for tumor margin assessment, developing novel viscoelastic phantoms for elastography, as well as ultrasound and elastography for rehabilitation applications. So to end this presentation, I would like to acknowledge my mentors, Professor Marvin Doyle from the University of Rochester, uh, who mentored me during my PhD and Professor Christy Holland, my postdoctoral mentor, uh, who taught me therapeutic ultrasound. I would like to thank the Indian funding agencies who supported this work, Science and Engineering Research Board, Department of Biotechnology, and the Gujarat State Biotechnology Mission. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to thank the people who actually did this work, the postdocs, PhDs, and the master's students who worked with me. And uh, I'm glad that they have been able to develop Muse Lab into an exciting environment in the short period of three years. So with that, uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, you found this talk interesting and I would like to welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. It's very interesting to hear about your lab's latest innovations and discoveries. Uh, it's very multidisciplinary. Uh, lots of things going on in both the imaging side uh, and also the therapeutic side, uh, like especially the cavitation detection. is very interesting. Uh, really, uh, thanks a lot, Alfred. Yeah. Okay, um, we would like to welcome questions from the audience. Maybe what I'll do is I'll get this started first with asking one question. I'm actually quite um interested in your passive cavitation detection work using the fiber grad. Uh, uh, break, uh, 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 detector uh, mechanism. That's actually very interesting, a pretty different approach to how others are doing things. But I was wondering if there is any possibility of extending this from being just a single element detector to actually kind of like an array where we can even do passive cavitation mapping. Right. In common uh, lab. Yeah, thanks, Alfred. Uh, that's a very important point you've made. So uh, actually, these gratings can be multiplexed. And you have these fibers where uh, on a single fiber, you can have multiple gratings. You can also have a 2D array. In theory, you could fabricate a 2D array of uh, gratings. And it should be possible to do passive cavitation mapping. Another relatively simple approach could be that instead of using a large number of gratings, uh, use uh, like a, maybe three or four gratings and use the process of uh, you know, localization by using 
uh, three or four gratings. I think four gratings would be necessary for uh, being able to, uh, able to uh, localize this cavitation uh, activity. So the possibility is there. Uh, at this point, we do not have the uh, instrumentation to be able to test two-dimensional gratings, but we are going to look at uh, one-dimensional gratings with a large number of gratings on a single fiber. So that's the next part of our work. And we are also looking at uh, whether we can simultaneously look at pressure as well as temperature using these gratings. So now we are extending this work to high intensity focused ultrasound mapping. And we are looking at whether we can detect these nonlinear waveforms and also look at temperature rise using a single grating. Mm -hmm. Sounds very interesting. Now, um, can you just also quickly comment on what would be the advantage of using this approach as opposed to the traditional way of trying to do passive capitation mapping? Right. Uh, so one advantage would be that if you want to have uh, immunity to electromagnetic interference, like maybe in an MR environment, oh. or, uh, or uh, say, if you want to have high sensitivity, because these gratings are quite sensitive, if you want to have small footprint. So uh, this is in comparison to a passive cavitation detector. Uh, certainly to compare to passive cavitation mapping, we would have to create, uh, you know, a map using the grating first. So that is something we would like to look at in the future. Okay, okay. Well, look forward to seeing more in the future. Now, a related question to this um, that was being posted in the chat box. Would the robustness of the uh, fiberbreak uh, grating measurements be affected by repeated strings on the fiber over time? Uh, well, thanks a lot for that question, Arushi. Uh, so these gratings are actually used in environments such as bridges, aircraft wings. And so they are actually designed to be used over a very long time and uh, they are pretty robust. So uh, the Young's modulus is pretty high as uh, Dr. Chandan Chai is uh, chipping in in the chat. So therefore there are no concerns regarding the robustness of the grating. Mm -hmm. That's actually another advantage of um, using your new approach. Looking forward to seeing more here. Now let's kind of like change channels a little bit. Adam has been asking a very interesting question. Um, how are the Volterra filter and cavitation detection for histotripsy affected by tissue motion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, so far we haven't really looked into tissue motion and whether that affects the results for the Volterra filter. But my uh, guess is that because this is a method which is based on uh, the spectrum, essentially. So as long as the frequency content of the received signal is not changing by motion, um, I think the method should still perform pretty robustly. So we are now in the process uh, of testing this uh, in vivo uh, with help from uh, Kenneth Bader. And that's when we'll get to know the performance, actually how it performs in the presence of motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I guess a very related question would be uh, like the extent of tissue motion actually varies quite a lot, right? Depending on um, the actual in vivo application. Uh, like, I guess a very interesting follow up to do is to see if there's a need for some sort of a motion compensation um, right. mechanism, all of the signal processing chain. Right. Because you're trying to, you know, after all, doing a bit of memory based uh, uh, detection, right, uh, of the cavitation activity. Uh, and so maybe some sort of motion compensation there might be needed, right? But that's for your further work. <laughs> okay, right. so let's right. move on to another question. Uh, this one is actually interesting in the sense that uh, it's sort of tied in with the histotripsy work. Uh, it's, I think, related to the high food temperature estimation process. Um, have you been trying to monitor this using ultrasound or other means? Yes. So we have just started uh, to uh, get into this, like high food temperature uh, estimation uh, using the fiber bag grating. So we have not uh, tried any ultrasound thermometry method yet. The motivation for this is that you could actually mount this grating on a catheter. And in case you are trying to ablate some tissue where the tissue is very close to a sensitive uh, organ or a nerve or something like that, then you could actually do a minimally invasive approach where you could put the grating in. So this is just a concept in a mind right now. We have not tested it in vivo. You could put the grating through a catheter near the target site, and you could monitor uh, that whether or not 
that sensitive area is being exposed to high temperature or high pressure. So that is what we are trying now. And we have already gotten some preliminary data showing that uh, we can measure both uh, the high intensity waveforms as well as uh, simultaneously measure the temperature elevation in a flow phantom, uh, in a phantom using these FPGs. Okay, well, lots of emerging work coming up. So I'm, I assume you're going to show this later on <laughs> in right. future right. webinars. <laughs> well, let's change gears a little bit. Uh, moving on to another question. Now, this one's kind of like more about the chemistry. Um, what's really the rationale behind using protein shell microbubbles as opposed to phospholipid shell bubbles? Right. Uh, so uh, as uh, Sumana, you have rightly said that there are already phospholipid shell bubbles and polymer shell bubbles. And when we talk about diagnostic imaging, that's when uh, phospholipid shell bubbles are used most widely. But if you're talking about therapeutic loading, polymer and protein shell bubbles, they have thicker shells. And that's why they have the capability to have higher loading of drug relative to a, a phospholipid bubble. When it comes to nonlinear signal generation and high imaging contrast, that's where phospholipid shell bubbles perform the best. So uh, we just wanted to see how well this formulation performs. So quite frankly, we have a colleague who's developing these uh, micro bubbles. And we really wanted to see how well this performs acoustically. That's why we started looking into uh, these micro bubbles. Now, they have already showed uh, some uh, you know, data with uh, drug delivery using these, uh, these uh, uh, protein shell bubbles. And uh, we would like to test this in vivo and potentially compare with uh, other approaches. Can you comment on the biocompatibility of your protein shell bubbles then? Right. So if you make like human serum albumin bubbles, for example, Optison. So that is already uh, clinically approved and uh, it is compatible. Now this work we have done, it is uh, with bovine serum albumin bubbles, which is not biocompatible, but through pegylation, uh, Samir's lab has shown that you could reduce the immunogenicity. But nonetheless, we en envisage that these bubbles, they are very cheaply made and they could be easily used for applications such as a superficial application uh, oral applications, like I mentioned, uh, oral cancer drug delivery, as well as, uh, for example, transrectal applications. So that is uh, what we have in mind. Okay, definitely trying to avoid the myocardium, right? Um, that right. would avoid the black box label <laughs> for, right. for contrast. All right, so a follow-up question in the chat box would be, what's really the specific reason for using C4F10 as your guest core as opposed to other guests? Right. Uh, well, so uh, common gases are these uh, gases uh, such as perfluorocarbons, sulfur uh, hexafluoride, which is in Sonoview, uh, definitely has octafluoropropane. So it turns out if you increase the number of carbon atoms in the perfluorocarbon, then it actually reduces the solubility. And, and then uh, as you start increasing uh, beyond a certain limit, there are, uh, if I recall correctly, there are some other limitations. So decafluorobutane uh, work from Mark Borden's lab has shown that it's fairly stable. Uh, bubbles made using decafluorobutane are fairly stable. So since we were uh, going from scratch, so we decided to use a decafluorobutane gas. An alternative would be to use octafluoropropane gas, which is uh, what Definity contains. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope that answers your question there, um, Smena. Um, so. I have other questions that I wish to ask. Since there are no other questions, I'll just throw them out here. I am quite intrigued about your newer work on um, sonar sanitizer development. So in, a, in other words, I, I assume you're trying to go the go down the sonodynamic therapy route. Um, right. And I guess your hypothesized mechanism here is RS generation. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, are you really going to be generating RS directly, or is it actually other types of mechanism there? Right. So we really want to take a deep dive into this, Alfred. Uh, the way you have looked very deeply into the cavitation and into the biological mechanisms, we want to do the same for sonodynamic therapy. So I have a colleague, uh, Dheeraj Bhatia here, who's a, a biologist. So we will actually, our plan is to first characterize some sonosensitizers. We also have a few other candidate molecule, molecules. And once we are happy with the sonosensitizer, uh, 
then we will do studies in uh, cells as well as three dimensional spheroids and we will look at ros generation not only in the media but the effect of ros even inside the cells and also uh, at what effects it has on the organelles etc mm -hmm. so that is one thing we want to do and we simultaneously want to detect cavitation so we have already also uh, uh, looked at uh, passive cavitation mapping in our group uh, so uh, one of our phd students is developing some algorithms for improving passive cavitation mapping so we would like to look into the mechanisms a little bit more uh, closely and then see whether or not it is the ros or it is a combined effect of ros and the mechanical effects Okay, well, just mind you, um, cavitation itself would be generating reactive oxygen species. So keep that in mind as you perform right. your studies. That's something very important. And I guess the key here is not to really just look at this from a biology point of view, but look at this from a biophysics point of view. Because um, after all, ultrasound, it is a mechanical way. Okay. Oh, right, so we, we engineers really are different. always looking at the physical aspect, but lacking the biological aspect. Uh, but but yes, uh, uh, totally agree, and uh, we'll be looking at both these. So one of the things we do is uh, we look at the control, and you know um, uh, we didn't see any loss of viability in the control studies. So I didn't show the data. There's also some temperature elevation uh, for the optimal parameters that we showed, beyond which there were diminishing returns in viability. Uh, so we get up to uh, five to seven degrees of uh, temperature elevation. So that could also be a mechanism. Nonetheless, in our control data, we don't see any loss of viability. So it could be a contributing mechanism, but probably not the predominant mechanism. Well, um, that would be subject to further investigation, I'm sure. Because uh, immediately they might be vi viable, but like um, over the course of time, their developmental behavior would have been disrupted because right? they are True. under stress. And that very likely would have other downstream effects. Uh, but that's uh, for further investigation, I'm sure your lab will be digging deeper into this. Now, looking at the um, acoustics again, um, that perhaps can become like the final question for today. Uh, so your current setup for acoustic exposure is to place your cell dish right on top of the transducer, coupling Correct. via gel, right? Right. So this particular approach has the problem, not only just of the standing waves, but with the issue of not having a homogeneous field distribution due to the fact that you're right in the near field of the probe. Um, right. So can you comment on the confounding factors and issues that are associated with this particular experimental or exposure technique? Right. So uh, we are now already looking at it and we are de developing an alternate setup in which uh, we actually uh, use uh, something which is submerged in a large water tank and we expose from the bottom, we have an acoustic absorber to avoid the air-water interface. Uh, the reason for doing these studies, that's why I mentioned that these are preliminary, is that at that point, uh, when we started this work, we did not have the ability to do a map of the ultrasound field, and we did not have the ability to have that instrumentation. But what we thought was, uh, to begin, uh, we do not have a good idea of the in-situ pressure, like, like you said. But nonetheless, we can test the repeatability of this experiment. And how do we test the repeatability of this experiment? Let's directly measure the ROS generation. So if the ROS generation uh, is coming out consistent, uh, uh, like then, uh, then we thought that, okay, maybe this is, at least the experiments will be useful, although they cannot be immediately translated to a more realistic setup. So that was the motivation for starting that work. But now uh, Dr. Manita Das from our group is already working into developing a better setup. And like I said, we are also looking at some newer molecules which have better ROS generation uh, ability. And hopefully we'll have something more uh, useful to report in the future. Okay, well, very much looking forward to this. I think like um, making sure that the ultrasound calibration aspect is done properly, um, it's very important, especially with you being an ultrasound researcher, right? Um, you need to demonstrate your due diligence there, right? <laughs> right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, this brings us to the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, this particular session will be made available on the UFFC Society uh, YouTube channel later this month. Uh, and later on, we will be sending out a brief survey 
it would be great if you can give us some feedback on the lecture series. And thank you very much for everyone's time. I hope you have enjoyed today's webinar. Uh, as you can see on the screen there, the UFFC Society will be hosting our next Latin America webinar series on September 1st. Please join us. And that brings us to the end of today's event. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Himanshu.